so delicious. So before, right, so before I introduce the people on the stage, I just want to know how many people in the audience have already read the book? Okay, that means that those of you who haven't put up your hand, you have such a treat in store. I wish I was you, and that I hadn't started the book, so I had it to look forward to. Which, okay, let me first introduce Marcia McMillan, who is on, on my far right here. Most of you must know Marcia, right? And we got to be friends because twice a year, I am fortunate enough to be on her show and we talk about books. We talk about books before Christmas and what people might want to buy. And we talk about books in the summertime. And every time we get to do this little five minute clip, and then she and I both want to not go to work, we want to actually continue talking about books, and we keep threatening each other to join a shared book club so that we can do this more often. And I said, well, Marcia, we should progress this idea, and maybe a good place to start the discussion is here tonight. So I just want to say, I'm always so grateful when you invite me on your show, and I'm so excited that you're here. I am so excited to be here, and it is a great pleasure and honor to be here. And uh, the only problem of her being here, Marcy being here, is I'm going to do the beginning of the interview, but now I have to do it with a professional oh, interviewer sitting on this side. So if I sound a little shaky, okay. okay. But now the, the very special part of tonight and that is, it is my amazing pleasure to welcome Patty Callahan to our stage tonight. Patty, we have no trouble for some sort of three minutes, and we could already go away on vacation. Yes. You know, you have that blink moment when you meet somebody, and they meet your expectations. Wait, aren't we already going on vacation? We're already going on vacation. I can tell you a little bit about what the formal write-up is on Patty, for those of you who have not had a chance to do it. But what I really want to say goes beyond this. But just, just to get the high points of what people uh, like to write about her, um, of course, Patty is a New York Times bestselling author of 15 novels, including the historical fiction Becoming Mrs. Lewis that we're going to talk about tonight. Her books include Losing the Moon, Between the Tides, Where the River Runs, When Light Breaks, Between the Tides, The Art of Keeping Secrets, Driftwood, Summer, The Perfect Love Song, A Holiday Story, blah, blah, and blah, blah, blah. And you can read them all because you get tired just thinking of them. A finalist in the Townsend Prize for Fiction, an Indie Next pick, an Oprah pick, and a multiple nominee for the Southern Independent Booksellers Alliance Novel of the Year. And Patty is published in numerous languages, and her articles and essays have appeared in magazines such as Southern Living, Pink, Writer's Digest, Portico, etc., etc. That's the formal part that's on the file. More recently, it's interesting to note that reviews of this book have included little phrases like enthralling writing, totally breathtaking story, telling ability, those kinds of adjectives. But what I really want to say is this, and I shared it with Patty a moment ago. Um, I effectively read books for a living. I am constantly being given books, shown books, encouraged to read books including people like someone I haven't seen since grade four, calling me up and saying, you know, we haven't seen each other since grade four, but, 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 and honestly, that just happened last week. It was just my time. But, but only every once in a while do I read a book, and when it's finished, I'm truly sad, and I'm being serious here, I'm really sad that the book is finished, and I'm still thinking about it months and months after I've read it, and wishing I could just dive back into that space where I am inside the story experiencing it unfold. And that is what I want to say to you, Patty, that you have written what, at least for me, is that kind of book. So thank you for writing it, and welcome. I'm so happy Formal. to be here. Great. I'm so happy to be here. I'm honored to be here, and I'm happy to be here. Okay. And thanks so, for showing up tonight, y'all. Yeah. Because we've got something. Thank you. So, and this, I shall tell you, in a store that they have tried to seal off from the public for two years now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm really glad you found your way. Because it makes me crazy yeah. every, every single yeah. time. Okay, so I want to ask right, you a few talk. things, and then Marcia, you can ask a few things. But there's so much about this book. Just let's start with this. What inspired you to tell this story? What inspired you to tell this story? So I've been a C.S. Re Lewis reader all of my life. And so I knew his wife tangentially. You know, there'd been a movie about it. He had written his book, A Grief Observed, about right. her. And I thought to myself, 
you know, who was this poet and novelist that so enchanted him that he grieved in this way so publicly in this book? And I thought, well, this is a really interesting love story. But the minute I sat down to write this love story, I realized it was so much bigger. It was actually the transformational journey of a woman. This astounding and spirited and brilliant woman who had made changes and transformed her life. And then that became a love story. It wasn't the other way around. It's interesting. Usually you've got the book to the movie. But there was the movie. Did anybody here see Shadowlands, the amazing Shadowlands? It is incredible how much that can exist on its own. Yeah. Just actually, my husband and I just rewatched it you? Because, because I didn't want to be like outside of the aura. And that is a wonderful movie. It yeah. holds up. But there's so many more layers in this story. And one of the things that I found so interesting is the poetry at the beginning of so many chapters is real poetry. Yes. To what extent did her words inspire the way you brought her to life? In every way. We were talking about this back there. She asked how I embodied her voice like that. And I read so much that she wrote. Essays, novels, poetry. But there was a box found about six years ago in her best friend's closet. And in that box were 300 unpublished Really? 300 unpublished poems. And among those 300 unpublished poems, there was one folder. And on the folder was written the word courage. And inside was a note that said 45 love sonnets for C.S. Lewis. So they've never been published? Or have no, they are now, but they had okay. not been. Mm -hmm. And so when I started doing research, I traveled out to the Wade Center where they were kept in this musty old box and read them. And her voice just exploded off the page because her poetry is astounding. This is a woman who won the Yale Younger Poets Award when she was in her 20s, right. and she told me who she was. In those so books. it was published subsequent to your starting the story. Did you, did your writing the book provoke them to publish No, the no, no. A man named Don W. King out of Montreat, North Carolina, publishes all her work. Okay. He gathers it and he publishes it. Publishes it. Yeah. You look like you're, you've got a question. I have, have, a, I have a question. Please. And I feel like, I, 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 I'm like a, a tad embarrassed to admit, it took me a few chapters in to realize that those sonnets were hers. Ah. And then when I did, I started to wonder, were those guideposts for you to write that chapter, mm. or did you go back? Because they, they sort of sum up and foreshadow what the next phase or chapter is going to be about. Oh, so I what came love first? that you noticed that. So when I was writing it, what you just intuited, which is... I told you she'd be better. Oh, stop <laughs> it. <laughs> well, what you intuited is that there were so many layers to this story. So many layers. And, and Shadowlands is amazing, but it's told from C.S. Lewis's point of view. Right? So it's, it's totally how he felt about her and about her death. Nothing had been told from her point of view. And so when I started to write it, it was becoming... A, it could have been a trilogy with all the things that went on in her life. So I had to pick a touchstone. I had to pick a side point. I had to pick something that when I started going down a rabbit trail of like her six months in Hollywood or something that didn't matter for this story, I needed breadcrumbs. I needed a touch point, mm -hmm. and it was her poetry. Because yeah, they were so there. Yeah. So the story for me existed on many levels. There is the love story. The love story itself, so let's, let, let's start with the love story and then we can take I found there were some interesting parts that I couldn't quite resolve for myself in the love story. But mostly, his uh, conviction or his um, relentless embracing of this notion of filial love. And so I can't say. So frustrating. Okay, so for those of you who haven't read it, right? So frustrating. Longest right? love courtship ever. <laughs> so, so I just yeah. want to like get into this. Okay. So I, I, I wondered, like, at one level, she had sort of been treated badly by her mother. She was then treated badly by her first husband. And at at some level, was this? I mean, you've got this woman who's madly in love with him, and you just know from the poetry she's like. So it's just can we make it to the bedroom yes. and he or the bed, and he is committed to this notion. Of, and 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 I even now I can't quite reconcile what was that really? What what was that? So I think it was a combination of things, as much as we can guess on this side of the grave. But 
Um, and you're right, the longest courtship ever. And, and it was different than, um, it's not like she was treated badly by him, by far from it. She had never been so connected to anyone. She had never, they had so much, that, and he always made sure she was near, and he loved her. Mm -hmm. But this caving in to love, to arrows, he would call it, and he has the book of four yeah. loves. The, the, physical. the physical, the, the true love. Um, for one, there are loads of reasons. For one, his armor. He had, I imagined the armor of this man about this thick. So a couple things. We have to remember he was 17 years older. She was completely inappropriate for him in, in Oxford and society's eyes. She was an American, New York, Jewish, divorced woman with two children. Nobody was saying, hey, Jack, this thing's like the love of your life. You should go for it. She's a real catch. Um, you know, so he had society against him. He had his own virtues, meaning the church was against it. He had the armor of, of believing that that was over for him, that love was not going to find him, that he was a confirmed old bachelor living in a man's man's world. He lived with his brother. You think he was conflicted sexually? I don't think he was conflicted sexually. I think he was completely locked up. Actually, I can almost imagine this armor with these big locks on it, and then when finally it fell off, and no, I don't know if anybody's loved that completely yeah. as yeah. he did. I'm really glad Heather brought that up because I started to think, in my own frustration, there's something wrong with me. I want this to to go quicker. Yeah. And, and at first it was really charming, and I thought, oh, this is the way that romance was back then. No. Not Instagram, social media, whatever. And where everything happens at a rap rapid pace. And then when it went on for years, and it was so clear that he was in love with her too, but he just wouldn't go there. He wouldn't admit it to himself. He wouldn't admit it to himself. So I'm glad that you brought that up. I, I just, you felt that she was tamping down what is a natural sexuality, and that she was having to make a trade-off as opposed to, so anyway, I, I and found I think that sometimes we can I get think, further here. But. <laughs> I, I think too that she, there were times when she wasn't tamping it down. So if you read your poetry, yeah. she admits to really coming on strong. You no, know, she wasn't tapping that, but yeah. in, the, in the end, she could not get him to the table. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She, she did. She did, right. So and and so what you have to remember, too, is there were years they were together mm -hmm. that, that we right. did. Right. Like, yeah. and, but you did build that thread beautifully. Yes. So there, there's that thread. Then I, thought, then I thought what was so fascinating was just reading a story set in that time and how well you captured the mores of that moment. Um, and so I, I wanted to ask you a, a little bit about that. Do you actually, how much is fiction not fiction? Because you sense that she really did have this inner strength that said, people may think I'm wrong and they may accuse me of leaving my children when she went off for six weeks or whatever. Um, but in the end, she did what was right for them and her. And her. So I thought that she was a terrific mother. I, 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 I never felt her as a mother that abandoned her kids. So I'm just curious to what extent did you have to imagine that and how closely does it hew to the reality of her life? So I wanted to soften that and um, I started to, but I don't in the novel. I don't soften it at all. Because I could almost hear her saying, not audibly, I'm not insane, but I almost could hear her saying to me, you get all of me or you get none of me. Because that's the kind of woman she was. Mm -hmm. Like, you have to tell the truth. We talked about this back there. You have to tell the truth of how it felt and what it meant. And, and the choices that she made were the best she knew how. I always say that um, she was born long before the beloved poet Mary Oliver, mm -hmm. but that poem, The Journey, mm -hmm. my oh one gosh, of my favorite poems of all that time. Poem. I just love that poem. On my library table right now. See, okay, so the, the last line where she saved the only life she could save. All the voices were crying, mend my life, mend my life. And she saved the only life she could save, which was her and her children. But in doing that, um, I keep saying we, we might not have to pack up our kids and move to England. Um, sometimes it sounds really good right now, but we might not have to pack up our kids and move to England, but we might have to pack up everybody's expectations and everybody's demands and what they tell us we can and can't do, and that's what she did. You, you do get the sense, and I'm sure, Marsh, you feel this way, that this is a woman with extraordinary inner strength and courage. Yes. Ahead of her time, oh. way ahead of her time. Out of step with her time, and yet she ignored all of the judgment, and, and went strong, ahead, right? and did it anyway. 
And you can even tell that in the writing, that her tone is different when she's in the New York farmhouse. Mm -hmm. You can almost feel the walls closing in on her. And once she arrives in London, everything opens up. And she notices everything, the sights, the sounds, the smells. She's present. She's present, and she's taking it all in. I felt that she was, and so I assert this for your response, She's, a, as I experienced her in your book, she was a very different character than most of the uh, compelling females I read about in that you could just throw all norms aside, so you know the women who choose, they just feel compelled to throw them all aside and leave their families because they, they just can't operate within them. Or the ones who somehow stay in their families and kind of work it out. She did both. Because it was important to her, if you, and I hope it came across in the book, that the, the three of them were a nucleus, and that she was going to, she had to grow as, as who she was as a woman. Um, you know, we can throw all kind of terms around her true self, mm -hmm. her, mm -hmm. but she was going to be that person with her children. And her son Douglas is still alive, and I talk to him a lot, and, you know, I ask him, what was she like as a mom? Because somebody had written something about how how bad it was that she had left them for those weeks to go to England before. I don't want to give too much away. And he said, when she was with us, we knew she was with us. It was a full presence, everything she did. She was right there. She, I never remember a time of her turning away or being too busy, even when she was sick. Because you, you did uh, bring that across. I actually had a huge argument with somebody who said, well, uh -huh. she left her kids and she did all these things and she was so bad for her own selfishness. And what you brought up in that relationship um, made me think of a tagline that a friend of mine uses in a foundation he runs where he says, uh, take care of yourself to take care of each other. And that, uh -huh. that is a circular idea. Mm -hmm. Take care yes. of yourself to take care of others, to take care of yourself to take care of others. And that it's circular. And so, if you, so, so that thread is a really yeah. interesting, her role as a woman against those times. Because subsuming who she was to take care of them would have, in the end, actually destroyed all of them. Mm -hmm. You mm -hmm. know? Mm -hmm. to, to, to go under the pressure of him and to subsume and say, this is okay, right. I'll figure it out, I would agree. have destroyed even her children. I agree. Yeah. The writing itself. I really think the writing is beautiful. Mm -hmm. I found that it felt so well edited. I didn't, I, I, occasionally you read a book you love, but you just wish there was a wee bit more editing. <laughs> this book felt like there was not a wasted word. So share a little bit about your writing process and how you felt about the final draft yes. script. And so when I first started this book, um, I was, we were talking earlier, I was quite literally obsessed. It was one of the only books I've ever written where even when I was doing something else, I was thinking about this. I was thinking about her. If I was listening to a podcast, it had to do with them. If I was reading extra work, it was about them. If I was taking a walk, I was doing scenes in my head. If I was traveling, I was traveling somewhere they lived and went. Because if you read about it in the book, I went there, everywhere in the book. And so I just became, to the point when I was writing it, so enveloped in it that it actually was too long. The first draft was about 700 pages. You have about 420. So because I wanted to tell you everything about her, I wanted you to know everything that made her who she is. Mm -hmm. And I had to um, really, like I said, use those touchstones. If it didn't have to do with that poetry I chose, if it didn't have to do with their improbable love story, it had to go, it had to go, it had to go. I needed you to not want to put that book down which meant I had to cut even the parts I liked. You could, you could, you could feel it. Did you have that same, that same reaction? I did. I loved, I loved the dialogue between the two of them. And I'm thinking specifically when he's deciding if he should leave Oxford. And there was one thought in it that I thought was so beautiful. He said, "We talk about change," and it was something to to the effect of, well, there's change that is is scary and change that makes you expand. Yeah, and I was like, wow. 
that is such a beautiful thought. It, it seemed like something that she would say. And I, again, I thought, how did you capture her voice? How, how would you know that she would say that to him? Because she those would be the right words. And what he needed at the time. And what he needed at the exact moment. Which goes back to what you said, to what you said about it taking so long, yet him always wanting her near. Mm -hmm. He needed her. He wanted to talk through everything with her. When she lived in London, he bought her a house in Oxford, and yet he still wasn't caving in that way. And it's because she could say things like that to him. Mm -hmm. When he was stuck or dry, she knew what to say, what to do. There was another um, part of the way the story unfolds um, that hit me, and I'm not quite sure whether it made me nostalgic or nostalgic for the past or ambitious for the future. And that is the cadence with which things moved. The idea that a letter would get written by hand and would get across the pond, and then he was, you know, would have to take his time, and then the letter would have to come back. And I'm, I'm curious to know again whether there was something about the, the, the cadence, the pace of life at that time that you were conscious of when you were writing, and yes. how what what you feel about that. That is such a great question. I mean, that is a great question because that was the funnest, one of the funnest parts for me about writing it, besides discovering all these secrets that nobody had been writing about, like every time I uncovered a little secret, it's like, woo, but was this sense of, of, dra of not dragging things out, but um, being more present, maybe. Yeah, more you present. know, you read the letter, then you reread the letter, then right. you take the time, and he wrote by hand. And you save the letter. And you save the letter, you tie it up in a string, you, and you think about it before you answer, you know, Click, 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 XO Patty. You know, you, you know, you really, and that pace, and, and also, speaking of pace, how much they would walk to talk. Yes. I loved that. The more I read about them, and about Lewis in general, that's what he did. He was a rambler, they called it, and he would, he would schedule his vacations around walking vacations. And the two of them would walk and talk and talk. The time they would spend just sitting in a pub, Talking to Don't you want to go to that pub and yes. that table? Don't yes. you just want to go over there and I imagine did. yourself? It was amazing. Almost like midnight in Paris, like you could walk back yes. in and see them sitting around the table Having with Tolkien. Yes. Yeah, with yes. Tolkien. Yes. yes. Oh my gosh, I just want to go there. I know. And listen, it was like if we could fold time and just sit yeah, in the exactly. rabbit room at the day for right. baby. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and that kind of thing where nobody's in a rush, nobody has to get home. Yeah. They just sit around a table. So all of that pace was. Yeah. So one last question for me and then to Marcia and over to the crowd. The one part, I don't know whether I didn't read it fulsomely, I don't know if there, I didn't grab it. I didn't quite, or I don't quite understand how, through their friends in Vermont, how that relationship really came to be. Like, I get it that somehow got connected, but what, what actually happened Chad there? Ava? Yeah. That was part of the 250 pages. That <laughs> so we call that a hangnail yeah. in the writing world. Um, so Chad Walsh was a very famous Bellioit professor in Wisconsin. I guess Bellioit's in Wisconsin, I think. Um, and he wrote an article about C.S. Lewis called Apostle to the Skeptics for Atlantic Monthly Magazine, mm -hmm. which among the literary crowd is a magazine mm -hmm. you never see. You ne right. And he wrote that in 19, I think it was 48. And he wrote that article after spending six months in Oxford with C.S. Lewis. And she found and read that article. That, this is what I love about Joy. Okay. So first she had read Lewis's books and said, he has some answers I need. Mm -hmm. Then she read the article by Chad Walsh and said, Chad Walsh knows this guy. She sought out Chad Walsh okay. and said, tell me about this man C.S. Lewis and how do I get a hold of him? And Chad, and, he, and same with, Chad fell as much in love with Joy as Lewis did in words, and they ended up becoming friends. She invited him to the farm. They ended up going. They remained lifelong friends, Chad and Ava and, and Joy. They came to see her in England, but that's how they met. Because uh, that part was really interesting. And then I guess um, one of the parts that came as a joyful, um, a joyful surprise, I just, I don't want to ruin the part about the relationship, but just that he so embraced her children because you imagine if he didn't, if C.S. Lewis did not embrace her children, 
that might have been an obstacle, but he fully embraced the children. Fully, even even protecting them against difficult bodies. Yeah. But this, but you can tell that I, and I guess we remain so enchanted in this story. We just want to um, prolong this moment. But um, let me turn it over to people in the audience. Would anybody yeah. here like to ask a question? Don't be shy. No, they never will. Go ahead. Hi, my name is Mahin. Hi. Um, I'm always a huge fan of uh, not only Heather and Marcia. I just read 35 pages of your book. Oh. I'm just a huge CS Lewis fan. Okay. My question would be, how would you reflect upon a transition of empowerment of a human soul mm -hmm. in both physical and emotional aspects? And how would you compare that from the era of like the 18th century, 19th century, um, we've seen or, or read rather like the Bronze Sisters, Jane Austen, uh, empowerment of uh, women in terms of gender equality all the way to C.S. Lewis and so um, he introduced the fantasy children, two of them, Susan and Lucy, yeah. very strong and bold. When you compare that to today's age, um, how can men and women get along with each other eye to eye, with respect, with love, with kindness and compassion, and where does the God come in? Oh, Lordy. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> That's a PhD. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, that might be above my pay grade. Um, but I will say this, that I think the transformational journey for any human, I'm gonna simplify it because that is a huge question. But I think that the transformational journey that any human makes, male or female, is about change and about being present to what's true for you. So I, I always say that Joy wrote this, one of my favorite quotes, I keep it in my office, which is, if we should ever grow brave, what on earth would become of us? And she wrote that in an essay and didn't answer it in the essay because she answered that question with her life. It reminds me a little bit of that Rumi poem where he says we have to live into the questions. And I think transformational journeys for human beings as a whole is about living into the questions and being open wow. to moving through things with, with honesty and truth. And, and I think that's why Joy was such a hero to me is because she an asked the question and then answered it with her life. And I think that's what any transformational journey is. And as far as the Bronte sisters and PH, like, um, I, I, don't, I don't know, but that's my simple <laughs> do you, do well, you That's think a beautiful that thought, though, that it is about the questions, the real questions, and then the journey they take us on. Yeah. And not ignoring the questions, answering them for ourselves, and, and entering into them. And the, que the questions are different for all of us, but being true to the questions that come up for us, you know, the truth of what that is for us is, is what. And then I guess if you ask the true questions, you inevitably will face some uh, scary, challenging yes. moments, which yes. she faced. Mm -hmm. You know, she turns up in London. She, so such a good. Yeah. Yeah. So was there a moment that you would say that was a spiritual awakening for her, or was it as Heather describes the journey with a few with a few stops along the way? Yes. So you know, when she writes about her childhood, she says that she, for example, when she was 11 years old, she would be walking through a winter forest, and all of a sudden, the world would come alive. The leaves, the light laying on the leaves, the way the world looked, and she would know there was something more. And then it was gone. And she would know it wasn't true, and she would let it go. Then there would be another moment and another moment. But the book, the moment that's in the book that really set her off on the journey was when her husband threatened suicide, and she realized that a presence greater than herself was in the room. And instead of ignoring that and saying, well, there's no, there's no such thing as something more, she kept asking the questions, she kept asking the questions, she kept asking the questions. There's a poet I love named David White um, out of Ireland, and he says, he calls it the beautiful question. And I love that. Like, you ask the beautiful, if you ask better questions, you're gonna get better answers. Uh, yeah. Another question. Yes. Actually, really easy question. <laughs> <laughs> Who compared? I'm sure it is. <laughs> and the writing were combined. I don't do them in a separate way. They're very braided together. Um, so I write and then I hit a wall and I need to know more about something or I find something out and go back and change what I've already written. But on the whole, it took me between three and a half or four years. Three years for the bulk of it. Though. And how many versions did you have from the big oh, one Lord. to? Uh, 
I, I don't, 12? Interesting. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I look forward to reading that. That is the, um, that is the um, kind of provocative part when, for me, when, the, when I hear writers talk about <coughs> writing and rewriting and writing and throwing out and that's hard, like the writing that's is so a baby, hard. right? Uh, the, today I saw um, an author I still love, Daniel Silva was interviewed this morning on television, and he talked about this most recent book that he wrote, and he imagined a future, and then it said in the uh, Middle East, and, and he imagined a future, and then all of a sudden the Khashoggi thing happened, and the relevance of the book just disappeared, and he had 220 pages of the book written, and he had to throw it out, and I just thought, wow, right? That is one of the things that is so, so hard. hard, and it makes us want to respect writers even more. That willingness to work and throw out, and work and throw out, and be willing to go back. So that's they call it kill your darlings. Uh, we have a really great writer here, Rachel McMillan. And um, she, she posted something the other day about some pages she had thrown away, and she said she considered them dress rehearsal. I was like, yes, I love that. <laughs> because you put, you put them away, you cut them, you put them in a file, and you mourn them. But if you consider it dress rehearsal, they don't feel like such a waste. Yeah. Another question. Um, yes. So can I continue with that question? Do you sure. have a place that you write, or a time of day, or how disciplined do you have to be? I do. I have a place. I have an office in my house um, where I work. And when I first started writing, my kids were five, three, and one. And so, How would you have time I know, write? right? So I was so obsessed. I used to be a nurse. My, my education is in nurse. My master's degree is in pediatric nursing. So writing wasn't. So when I first decided to do this thing, I either had to make the time or, or just let it be a dream that shimmered out there. So when I first started writing, I was writing from 4.30 to 6.30 in the morning. I do not do that anymore. Like, at all. And no way. But it was that important to me. And so what that did do was start a habit where I write in the morning. And so my writing time, I try to keep very sacred when I'm not on the road or on tour. I try to keep my writing time very sacred from until at least noon or one. Make sure I don't make appointments, make sure I don't. And so I am disciplined about that or the pages won't get done. So we can talk about writing, we can you know, read about writing, we can, but if I don't sit down every day, there's nothing to talk about. Okay, one more and then we'll let some books get signed. Yes. So, um, I'm just wondering why you chose the scene at the, for the prologue at the zoo with the lion and kind of the okay. correlation between maybe another lion. With that. So when I started doing my research, I realized that nobody had really made the connection between the lions in her life and of course the great lion, Aslan. And when I realized that connection, I knew that the lion had to book end the novel. Because if you've re read it, obviously you have, that you know, we open with a lion and we end with the great lion's roar. And when I read one of her many you know, things about her, that it is true, she and her brother would sneak out in the middle of the night, break into the Bronx Zoo, and the lions would come to the cage, and she, to the bars of the cage, and she would feed them. Now, the line that I end that prologue with, which is, I'm so sorry, or as you say here, I'm so, so <laughs> sorry. <laughs> we, 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 as Dave told me today, it's spelled with an O, not an A. <laughs> I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. We were meant to be free. And when she said that, which sounds crazy, like I heard her voice, I knew that was the whole theme of the book, was we were meant to be free. And so I knew I had to open with that scene, and then we closed with the lion also. And there were the lion theme entered often in her life. I couldn't show all of it, but she helped raise the MGM lion when she was in Hollywood. The baby lion. She helped raise it. So that theme was important. Thank you for noticing. So here's here's my prediction. I mean, this book will soon be a bestseller in Canada because of all of you and everyone who's joined yes, Heather's right. Book Club and done it. <laughs> but I predict that it will also get to the very top of the New York Times bestseller list. And they're just slow in the US, but they just look slow. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and it reminds I'll, I'll me of um, one of the very first books when I first started this company I ever picked was a book called
called The Secret Life of Bees. Oh, yes. Yes. And that book, that book became a bestseller in Canada two and a half years, two and a half years before it hit the radar. If you go back and check, it was a bestseller in Canada two and a half years wow. before it surfaced in the U.S. because it takes a long time given a whole bunch of things yeah. you know, that are going things on here. Yeah. Um, but this book will make it. This book has all of the good elements, and we are so lucky that you wrote it and, and that so you wrote it with this. So just thank you so much. And Marcia, we have to make this a show. We have to take this we show. Do. Yes. Yes. do the other books with you? Yes. Do you our book club? Um, but they said yes on stage. Yes. <laughs> uh, thank you all so much for coming. Thank you, thank for, you coming. for caring about reading and about stories and about sharing this passion with us. It is so wonderful. Thank you. Thank you.